Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our afternoon session. So, uh, we are going to have Dr. Marty there make a presentation. I hope you all enjoyed the lunch. Yes. Okay. Great. Doc, over to you. Right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about. We've spoken quite a lot about um, lower limb X-ray. Uh, we're going to talk about other uses that we can use X-ray and ultrasound for, and um, what we're talking about creativity and fitting into our needs rather than the other way around. Really. So, just a little bit of non-lower limb um, X-ray and ultrasound, um, basically imaging of our body parts. Right. So, starting with radiography. As we've all by this stage figured out, radiography is really good for imaging the skeleton. So the, the bones predominantly is, it doesn't give us very much uh, definition or, or detail with really, any of the soft tissue structures. doesn't mean we can't take some information out of it, because we definitely can, but it's mainly for the skeleton. But you can see the different um, you know, parts that can be used and we can try to image. However, a big limitation, like Ben was saying earlier and we've already talked about as well, is the power generating capacity of our equipment versus the thickness of a big horse or a big donkey that we try to x-ray and penetrate through. So those are the main limitations that will dictate our use of x-ray. So for example, x-ray of the head. Why would we want to x-ray the head, other than to check the size of the brain, perhaps, or the Homer Simpson one? So we can think about bony pathologies in the head, any examples? We can look at teeth. We can look at lots of bone. We can look at, what are these guys over here? This is air chambers. Sinuses. Exactly. So lots and lots of reasons, actually. It's actually quite useful. Um, diagnostic imaging tool for the head. So clinical scenarios, for example, that we might think of, if we get an animal, in this case a horse or a donkey, presenting with nasal discharge, for example, or presenting with chronic um, discharge and chronic respiratory problems, for example, we might want to think about the sinuses. We might want to image these structures. What happens if I put my ultrasound probe over the sinuses? can't get it exactly because all I will get is that superficial layer of the bone. So ultrasound is not great for sinuses unless you know, your bone has somehow disappeared. So for this we will need x-ray because we need to penetrate that first layer of bone that involves the whole skull to see what is going on inside. Again, if I have teeth problems, so for example if I get an animal that has been dropping lots of food, that's quitting when it eats, that has very bad smell from the mouth, and any other indication that just might have bad teeth. You might want to look at the state of those teeth, and what better way than, well, <coughs> you should also open the mouth and look in the mouth, but if you need further diagnostics, then you can take an x-ray, because teeth show up very, very nicely on x-ray. Or, for example, if you're called because an animal's been involved in an accident of some sort, or the road, and you might want to investigate the extent of um, the trauma and if there is any potential fractures, or many, many other options, really. So this view here, who can I pick on? Who's going to tell me which view this is? Don't all scream at the same time. <laughs> Lateral, exactly, just lateral media, that's perfectly perpendicular to the head, so we get essentially what is a 2D image of one side of the head, we're actually getting the whole head in the picture, we just can't distinguish anything between the two sides. Perfect. So to get a um, lateral view of the head, or any view of the head, we actually need to think about some patient preparation like we've spoken. If you think about the head, and a lot of horses and donkeys will be quite shy around the head, they might think about to put a bit or you know their eyes are just there and you're about to put a big extra plate and take a big generator next to them they're bound to be you know frightened of that and move and it's very difficult to get them still so 
very often, it doesn't mean to say that we always need to use it, it depends on the temperament of the animal, but very often you will need the animal to be sedated for this. So droopy, drowsy head, otherwise yeah, there will be some movement, it is a scary thing to have all around your head and your ears and all that. So think about that. Think about having a headstand, otherwise you don't know if your animal is sort of leaning and tilting. Um, so again, make your life easy. And again, think of not, no metal that could overimpose over the bone, for example. So replace it by a rope head collar, or just have someone restraining. <coughs> so common views of the head. Lateral x-ray, as you can see in here, is great to looking at teeth. Correct? Eh, wrong. How many teeth can I see here? They're all overimposed. I can't really tell what's wrong with what. I know, I can't even make sure if this is my left arcade or the right arcade, it's, it's really not great. What we mainly use, well you can look at it to look at the occlusal surface, so animals that would have lots of problem teeth would have a very sort of wavy mouth and you can see, okay, I might have to address this with some rasping and so on, but mainly the lateral views like this are good for the sinuses, so our air-filled cavities um, over here, or any other trauma, fractures and, and so on way to position it, again have your patient as still as possible, you can see here for example they just have um, um, a rope head collar, you can just bail twain or something like that, just to essentially not have any metal so you're not hiding anything. And then just center it 3-4 centimeters below the orbit and make sure you include the whole of your teeth if you're looking at the arcade and include the whole of your sinus and the whole of your mandible. Don't cut any bits off because very often there will be little nodules at the bottom of the jaw here or different types of pathology. So make sure you include the whole anatomy. If the animal's very big, you might have to do it in two sections, but just do it in two halves just to make sure you're not cutting anything off. But if you actually wanted to do the roots like we were talking about, um, so if we think Maybe this judge, for example, might be because of a tooth infection that has a bit of a dodgy root um, and is producing pus and infection into the sinus, then we need to talk about obliquing it. Like it's the same story as the sesamoids, the same story as, as all of the basic positioning. So in this view, they're overimposed. I have my left arcade, these are my two arcades, they're both overimposed. So I need to oblique it so that one of them will be highlighted and you can see. Uh, the teeth root closest to the plate um, at an angle, so you would shoot from slightly underneath, have the plate slightly higher up, and shoot a little bit down towards up, and that would highlight those roots, uh, which is what you want to see and where you want to look for root problems. And what are these little lines? So these would be the so-called fluid line. So if we have problems in the sinus, infection in the sinus, sinusitis, that will produce pus and inflammation and inflammatory secretions essentially. And that can be picked up in x-ray. So x-ray isn't great to look for fluid, but we know if we look at this sinus here, which by the way is the frontal sinus, uh, we can see that it's black because it's full of air and x-ray just goes through the air so it generates black. However, these lines here, we know they're not bone, there's no bones that have this orientation, and it's some sort of opacity that it's not, that it means that these cavities are not just filled with plain air. So these are fluid lines, and the reason why they're lines is if we put the head of the horse down, and this is why, again, sedation is really important, and we just sort of position the head vertically, like in this first slide, or as vertically as possible, by just normal law of gravity, if I had any fluid in a pocket there, it will just sit as a line, it will just all pull down, and you can see those little lines that might indicate that there is infection in the sinus. So that's one use of it. You can also take um, dorsoventral views of the head. Um, you can use it for several things, so you can use it if you think the teeth are, are, are misplaced axially or abaxially out of the, the arcade, or if you have what they call supranumerary teeth, um, so more teeth than normal, trying to fit into a lower space, and you will see deviations of that. You can just use it to look at the bone. You can look at the bones of the jaws, assess any osteosarcomas, for example, any type of masses, or, or any use, really, that will require you to view uh, this part of the anatomy. Again, positioning is key. You need to make sure you have 
good stance and the, and the horse very relaxed and normally sedated to just sort of rest the head on the plate and then you know that it's not going to move. And you just shoot from above and you can play a little bit with the but theoretically you should try to be perpendicular to, to the nose. And then finally, this might be very useful, particularly in the context of trauma and accidents and that sort of thing. We can do also intraoral views in which we actually um, investigate and image the mandible and the maxilla separately. And the only way to not overimpose this, because if you can tell through here, you're looking at one on top of the other, so you can't really make up what is what. So you would need to actually put the plate inside the mouth and do what we call an intraoral view. And this is particularly useful for these cases. So you can use it for incisor pathology, for example, if you're worried about uh, bad teeth and the incisors, but mainly for sort of fractures and mandibular fractures that you need to assess the extent and the severity and whether you can put a wire to fixate them or not. Now, be very careful with the equipment uh, because, you know, particularly if your horse is not sedated, it will chew on the plate, so often you need to put a gag or, or, or something along those lines, just depends on the temperament of the animal. And also, you can't get very far, unfortunately. You can just see this sort of incisor um, corner, but equally, that's where most of the pathology will be in terms of fractures because it's also thin and fragile, and in terms of, obviously, incisor pathology itself. Right, now, other uses of x-ray. We can x-ray the spine, for example. We can um, look at the upper part of the spine, or we can look at the withers, or we can use it the rest. Realistically, in normal practice, and if you go out on the road and do ambulatory practice, you're not really going to be x-raying this segment of the spine here, because purely because of a, a mechanical point of view and an anatomical point of view, there's just a lot of tissue, lots of muscles, there's a big um, width over there, and most x-ray equipments aren't powerful enough, and most of the portable ones aren't powerful enough to generate images that can um, look at this area here. You can do it, there's several hospitals that do it, but you, you need to send them for specialized equipment, so don't be frustrated, don't try to image these um, areas of the back, because more likely than not, you will just not be able to get any images. But you can conveniently look at the withers, and you can look at the withers quite easily um, in horses and donkeys with a normal x-ray machine. And that's quite convenient because a lot of the time, our back problems will be in the withers area. So we can think about fistulous withers, for example, um, where we might want to investigate some bone damage um, or some trauma if they fall, if they fall on their backs. And, and they might have fractured one of these sticking out processes, and um, we can look at all of that quite easily, even with the normal um, equipment. The way to do it is to center approximately 10 centimeters below the, the sort of the, the, the top line of the horse, and this is because if you go back to this picture, and if you look at the skeleton, remember that the actual spine is quite lower down at the wither, so because they're so long, you actually need to obtain the lower margin rather <coughs> down compared to the surface of the skin of the horse here. So going back to this, you want to aim a centering about 10 centimeters um, below the, the, the top line of the horse and try to collimate um, to include the whole of the withers. So is this a good x-ray or a bad x-ray? You said bad. Why, why do things bad? Exactly, so it's too narrow, you're not getting everything, and you're cutting the, chopping the tops off. So, you know, they are sort of the more exposed and more vulnerable. You need to make, you can't, looking at this, say, oh, this all looks fine. Well, maybe your problem is just here, and you just about don't have it. So, nothing wrong if your animal is too big, but you need to do another view to complement it and make sure you've seen the whole story. And so again, like we've spoken about, this would be very useful. It's very useful for us in a working animal point of view because they get a lot of this horrible disease, which is fistulous withers, which is whether by trauma or pressure necrosis from bad harnessing and all of that. They, this area is just traumatized and it becomes infected, forms fistulous tracts of infection throughout. <coughs> Sometimes it can affect the actual bones and the infection can spread into the bones and cause osteomyositic processes. In this case, that's not what we're seeing. We're actually seeing fractures here in this. So this could have been a trauma. But it's important to remember 
that these little guys here, as Ben has already mentioned in his lecture, these are normal variations. They are not a fracture, and you would equally suspect, so hang on, is it likely that I have a fracture on every single process? Maybe something is not right. So these are just different centers of ossification. This is a normal variation. But these are the abnormalities here, and also these bits of calcification of the tissue. But also, if you're looking at x-ray, yes, it's amazing for bone, that's the main use, but you can take some information about soft tissue. We already know that gas looks black on x-ray, it just goes through, it's the air, like the end of the cassette here, for example. So if I see an area that is more black, sort of invading here, and I already know that I have sort of a case like this, this gives me clues. This gives me clues that maybe there's bacteria producing gas due to infection there. And that helps you evaluate any potential tract, any potential extent of the infection, and the, and, um, the tissues that it's involving, the depth that it's involving. So don't just look at the bone, look at everything. Because yes, it's not great for soft tissue, but you can get some clues. So it's important to remember that as well. Right, other uses of x-ray. Do you think we can easily image the abdomen of a horse? We just take an x-ray, like a dog or a cat. No, exactly. So mainly because they're enormous and they have huge <coughs> bellies and it's just too thick, too much structure to go through and you, you, you virtually can't image the abdomen of the, the adult horse. You can image sections of the abdomen. So for example, <coughs> this here um, is an example of what we call a sand enteropathy. So in this case, this donkey or horse suffered from colic, and it's nothing too dilated, nothing toxic, lives in you know, a field or somewhere with a lot of sand in the pasture, and they just, you know, grass might be very, very short, and they might end up eating loads of sand together with their bits of grass and, and, um, and forage. So maybe they just got a lot of sand in their gut, which does indeed cause colic, and a way to see that is for x-ray, if we x-ray, we can see this abnormally radio-dense structure, which will just be gravitating sand. We can't really tell where it is, because we can't make up soft tissue distinction with the x-ray, but we can assume that it's gravitating down, so this will be your ventral background <coughs> somewhere, and you can see that there's definitely a substantial amount of something that's not normally there. So that's one use of it. Otherwise, in falls, falls are like essentially big dogs, so you can x-ray the abdomen of a fall and um, expect to find a lot more. So remember that falls are special little creatures on their own, and you can use a lot of these things a lot more easy, easily than you would use in an adult. You would also show up foreign bodies, so maybe the fall has swallowed a spoon like the slide that Ben showed, or, or maybe it got a wound and got something trapped that has been so late uh, so so far long ago that it's sealed over, but then you can still see it on x-ray. There's several options, so just be creative and understand what, what can be radio-opaque and what you could potentially see on x-ray. And then finally we can talk about x-raying the thorax. This, again, is a bit of a mission in an adult horse, and you cannot really do this with normal equipment uh, of portable x-ray. You can't. You can do it in specialized hospitals, or you can do it with falls, because they're tiny enough that you can penetrate through the whole thorax. But if that's the case, then it's just like small animals. You can look at your um, interstitial patterns, for example. This one also has a bit of a bronchial pattern with the, the typical donuts around the, the, the bronchial cuffing, for example. Um, Rhodococcus infection, for example. I don't know if you have a lot of Rhodococcus in Zimbabwe. Have you heard of it? Yeah. So yes, in falls, it would seem like the type of weather where you'd probably get a bit. And they show up with abscesses. So again, abscesses are um, <coughs> consolidations of the lung that should normally just be nice and black, full of air, but shows this sort of um, white consolidated bits that might just be focused on infection. So there's quite a lot of information that you can take from lung x-rays, just the practicality of doing it in an adult horse that normally doesn't allow its use. Right, moving on to ultrasound. Now, ultrasound of the abdomen. We've already spoken about allowing the owners to clip the whole abdomen and having a naked horse and then spending loads of time looking at him. But we can 
genuinely use ultrasound for all sorts of purposes. And this is why I think it's really important to highlight how versatile ultrasound is. You can use it if you suspect an emergency, so for a quick imaging of the soft tissue uh, that could be causing emergency. Or you can use it for really thorough investigations of chronic cases and, and all sorts of other pathologies. So for example, colic, this is the big one, and we'll talk a bit about it because obviously in horses and donkeys this is a huge problem. It's, it's the pain of the life of an equine vet, and um, you will need to know how to use ultrasound in your favour when investigating a case of colic. Also, you can use it for, for other life-threatening um, conditions like peritonitis, for example. Very good for that. You can use it to investigate hernias, be it you know, umbilical hernias in falls or, or, or inguinal hernias. Um, and then, like I said, you can use it for just sort of normal, non-emergent, uh, non-urgent medical evaluation. So if an animal has been losing weight for two months and you don't know what to do, can you x-ray? I mean, then what is that going to tell you? It's probably, not gonna, it's probably nothing wrong with its bones to make it lose weight. So it's probably likely something within the gut, and you can use ultrasound to look at gut, but you can't use x-ray to look at that. You can look at masses, you can look at cases of recurrent colic that keeps happening, but it's not severe enough to be life-threatening, so is something probably um, wrong with the confirmation or the anatomy or um, the physiology of that gut, and you can assess that with ultrasound. So looking at colic as our first sort of equine emergency that we can assess with ultrasound, you can see all sorts of things. Essentially, colic is a malfunction of the gut that generates abdominal pain, um, and therefore ultrasound is really going to be your only hope because there's nothing that x-ray can really tell you other than if it's a chronic sand colic like we've just spoken about. So you can look at distended loops of small intestine, like I've showed you on the previous slide, which would be very helpful to be able to recognize because that will immediately tell you or help to tell you the severity of the lesions. And you know that if you see lots of distended small intestine, that it's not moving, that it's not contracting with poor peristalsis, then you're, you're probably in trouble. You can look at the size of the stomach. The stomach is soft tissue. You can see if it has lots of reflux inside it because reflux is fluid, and you can see lots of fluid with ultrasound. You can look at increased peritoneal fluids, if there's some sort of peritonitic process, if there's a rupture, for example, that has generated lots of free fluid. You can look at the thickness of the um, gut. You can investigate if there's any diarrhea. Um, you can even look at some positional, um, some positional changes, although this is not necessarily 100% uh, reliable, and I'll, and I'll talk about that in a second. But you can look at all of this, and the really good advantage is that you can look at it in real time, and that is a very big advantage of ultrasound compared to x-ray, because you can put your probe and see what happens. You can watch the gut move or not move and gain information from that, whereas x-ray is a statical modality, as we all know. Right, so looking at what we might see on the abdomen, and um, not necessarily just on a case of the colic, but on a general abdomen ultrasound. It's important to do both sides because our probe, our frequency is never going to be strong enough that you can penetrate through the whole of the abdomen on the same scan. So you need to scan one side, be aware that realistically you can only really see about 15, depending on the probe, depending on the animal, but you wouldn't really see more than 15, 20 centimeters deep. So you're not scanning the whole abdomen, and that's very important to know. It doesn't mean that you'll find whatever is wrong. You're sort of scanning um, around the abdomen, but only uh, about 15, 20 centimeters deep depth at the most. So, what structures have we got on the right side? So we obviously have the cecum, the colon, the ventral colon, the dorsal colon, the duodenum. Um, we can see some liver on the, on the right hand side as well, and these would be the main things that we would um, look at when we're scanning the right hand side of the abdomen. So, <coughs> if this is the right hand side, and I have a homogeneous sort of grey soft tissue structure, what could this be? <clears throat> right, this is a difficult one, but this is the liver. And you know it's the liver rather than the spleen because the spleen is on the left hand side. So you can see the liver because this is the only thing that would seem this consistency on this part of the anatomy. And again, we go back to putting things into context. And then we see this. So this essentially bright white line with sacculations. 
So what, what are we thinking here? If we go back to this slide. Yeah, exactly. So there's two main organs that are circulated. Well, the cecum, but the sort of B circulation, or the colon. And within the colon, we know that the right ventral colon has these circulations, but not the dorsal. So we already kind of know what we're looking at. And we know it's that because, very much like the lungs, the colon is full of air. It's, it's doing partial fermentation. And so all we can really see is the bright line, what bright white line of the air. And we can't really see anything of it because we already know that ultrasound doesn't go through air. So if we look at this picture again, so we have a little bit of the liver, we have the duodenum here, and we have the right dorsal colon, and you can already see this again, bright white line, so because the colon is full of gas, so you can't see through it, but this time it's nice and smooth, so also in context with the other organs, so putting it in this context, we know we're in this area here rather than this area here. Okay, all right? And this, for example, is a very good... Um, landmark to find, and if you're scanning a colic, you should always try to find this little bit of small intestine for two reasons because it is the only portion of the small intestine that you can recognize because the rest, or the ileum and the jejunum, you, you can't, and it's too long and too much of a mush. But this little segment here of the proximal small intestine, you know by the anatomy, it's not entirely mobile like the rest of it in the abdomen, so you know that if you find it here, that is going to be your duodenum. And you can assess it, and you can stop your probe in this location once you've found it, and look at it, and watch it move. That's the beauty of ultrasound. You can see it move. And in a normal, healthy horse, you want to see it moving, you want to see it contracting, you want to see it collapsing right down. It should just look like a little, a little collapsed flap like this. That's perfect. That's what we want, because it's moving. If it's a big circle, then it means that this is distended, and the danger is that this is the closest segment to the stomach, so it's very likely that your horse also has a lot of reflux, and therefore you need to pass a nasogastric tube and empty that out for the horse. Right, so looking at the left-hand side of the uh, anatomy now, so just a recap of anatomy, as we know, we have the stomach, that's sort of hidden away by the spleen, so we can't really see much of the stomach. And then we have the left colon here. And we can see all sorts of small intestine, depending on, on the area. Sometimes, this is very variable. You can sometimes see little sections of liver as well on the left-hand side, but it's not your ideal location to find it. It's much easier to find it on the right. <coughs> Looking at this on scan, so again, spleen. And I know this is the spleen if I'm scanning, for example, this bit here, because this is far too caudal to be the liver, and because I know I'm on the left-hand side, so this is why I need to know my anatomy. I can see a left kidney here, and again, this can only be the colon, because I don't get any signal through, all I get is the gas within the gut. Can anyone think of a condition, rather a colic presentation, on which it might be very useful to have this picture? Exactly. Oh, everyone seems to know this. <laughs> That's exactly it. So, uh, one of the criteria to ruling out an nephrosplenic entrapment of the colon is if you can see on the same ultrasound window your spleen and your kidney, which means that that space between the two, so the nephrosplenic space, is not filled with a displaced colon. Because if my colon was in between the two, I could not see the other structure. Why? Because the ultrasound doesn't go through air. So if I have colon full of air in between the two, I could never get the two on the same picture. Does that make sense? So we need to be a little bit careful with that because seeing this is a very strong indicator that there isn't an nephrosplenic entrapment, but not seeing the kidney and the spleen in the same picture doesn't necessarily mean that you have it. It might just be that you know um, the kidney is, is further in or full of fat or you're just getting bad pictures. But it's a good clue nonetheless. Then if you find a small intestinal window, you can see small intestine. And the reason why we can see the whole loop is because unlike the large intestine, the small intestine is full of ingestor content. So we can penetrate through the whole lumen and see both margins. And as opposed to the large intestine, which is again just the bright white line, and that is a lost world of gas. What we're doing here is measuring. So another of the things that the ultrasound that you can take to advantage is measuring. You can Watch it move, and then you can measure it and determine whether or not those measurements are within normal. Anyone knows how much 
small adjustable wall should measure in a healthy voice. So it shouldn't be more than about three millimeters on each wall. However, the easiest way to measure it is from lumen to lumen. So find two loops that are together, like in this case, and dot a line. I'll show you how to do it tomorrow in the practical, if we can. Um, a line between lumen to lumen, and then you know you have the two intact walls, and then you get a measurement. And just remember to define that by two, otherwise you'll find that everything is thick. And that's it, really. And then, as a final image, a very useful um, ultrasound window to have on um, ultrasound is this one that includes the stomach and the spleen. So going back to this slide, we'd be looking at about this level. This is really useful mainly to allow us to recognize the stomach. So if we find the spleen, and if we find this little vessel, which is the gastrosplenic vein, then we know that the gas-filled structure next to it is the stomach rather than the colon because it just means that we're at this level, if we find this, the vein here, which is in between the two, as opposed to being at this level, which would have no big vessel to tell us that we're also in between a gassy structure and the spleen. And this is important because we might want to know how big the stomach of a horse is. So in a normal horse, the stomach should only be three intercostal spaces. You should only really see it if you scan um, if you put your probe in between three spaces and then it should just disappear. Because the stomach should be small, the stomach should really only hold about, um, about three liters, maximum four or so of normal fluid. If it's holding more than that, and if it's distended because of that, then you can follow your stomach through more uh, intercostal spaces and that tells you that your stomach is dilated. And if it's dilated with fluid, then again, that might be an indication that you might have to pass an nasogastric tube and empty the reflux out of that horse before you risk having a rupture, for example, of the stomach. So in a colleague that you're not sure whether it has reflux or not, you can quickly pop the scanner, see how big the stomach is, and then decide what your priorities are. And again, this is what we're trying to avoid. So this is what we call DSIs. These are distended loops of small intestine. But we, in reality, we're looking for two things, and this is why be patient enough, spare 10 seconds of, of your life, and stop the probe there and watch it move. Because it might actually be nice and big balls like this, but actually moving, collapsing right down ever so often, which means things are actually moving along to some degree. Or it just might be these huge circles and not do anything at all, which is a much worse situation because it indicates complete stages, uh, stasis. Sorry. Um, and again, that is likely to indicate two needs. The need to reflux it to start, because if the intestine is like this, it's not moving things along from the stomach to the colon, so that stomach might be very, very full of reflux and you might have to empty it urgently. And it might very likely indicate that there is an obstruction, a physical a twist, for example, and that needs to go to surgery if it's going to stand any chance um, to untwist it, so to speak. Other things you look at, again, we spoke about fluid. Ultrasound is brilliant for fluid. So you can look for free peritoneal fluid. If you have a lot of it, it might just be a case of, of colic, loss of protein, lots of fluid. It might be a colic that has ruptured and therefore you have gastric contents all over your, your peritoneum. Or it might be a completely different scenario. It might just be a, a peritonitis, just infection, inflammation, with lots of exudate into that peritoneum. And as we've spoken, it's just the pure black um, and in this case, it's actually not very much. It's normal to have little bits of fluid. And you can use this to your advantage if you ever need to take a sample. So if you ever need to do an abdominus and thesis, like in this, or a belly tap, um, then you can find, um, you can use your ultrasound to locate the best pockets of fluid, and then just aim there. And it's important to think again, thinking of your probe and thinking of orientation, the best way to look for fluid is at the very bottom of your belly, because obviously, Gravity, it just all gravitates down, so if you're going to find it, you're going to normally find it easier there. But then that means that you're seeing your picture upside down. So remember, this would be your probe here, but your probe would be looking at this, it would be projecting an image like this. So just remember what's closest to the probe, in this case, would be this, and what's furthest to the probe would be this. So your anatomy might be upside down because of where you position. Sometimes, in an emergency situation, trust me, it's hard to forget, and <laughs> you get things upside down. 
And then, just to finish up with colic, um, we can do what's called the flash emergency scanning. So you can spend an hour, if you want, investigating a case of chronic weight loss where you scan very thoroughly every single intercostal space from the top of the space to the bottom of the space and you look at all the possible anatomy you can. That's great, you stop, you take measurements, you save pictures, that's all very well, but obviously you don't have time to do that in a colic and you don't need it, there's, there's no reason why you should. So there's actually this very quick approach that you can do in full or just in parts. You can essentially know these key little areas that you would look for the most relevant pathology in colic just to quickly put the probe on key areas and try to identify the main changes that might uh, give you important information in the colic scenario. So again, you can just very quickly uh, pop your scan on the ventral abdomen and see if there's lots of fluid uh, or not, because that will all gravitate down. Window number two is the gastric window, so again, just very quickly try to count, you don't need to measure, you don't need to follow it through, but just see how many intercostal space your stomach extends through, therefore assessing the size of the stomach. You can very quickly just put the scanner on this area here and look at your uh, renosplenic window just to see whether or not you might have an infrasplenic entrapment. Or you can just look um, sort of at the flanks um, as well and look for um, loops of descending small intestine. If you're actually going to find some, you very often find them in the flanks, so you kind of need to go into the groin area of the horse. And on the right hand side, um, you can look at the duodenal window, so just this tiny little segment here, just see how well it moves for all the reasons that we've spoken about. And then um, again, <coughs> the, um, the middle third, so for any sort of dilated small intestine. But you don't need to be thorough, you just you know what you're looking for, try to find those structures and very quickly assess it um, in a case of emergency. Right, moving on to the lungs. So, the lungs actually take a huge space, which also means that they include a lot of the view of your abdomen, because obviously, in here, for example, <coughs> well, within the depths of the abdomen, there will be lots of abdominal organs that you can't see simply because they're coated with a lung that doesn't allow your probe to, to generate any um, images from. But you can still, even though the ultrasound doesn't go through air, it's still very, very useful to assess lung morphology. And it's very easy because there's not that many things you can see, so there's only a couple of things you can really look for. You can look for pleural effusion, because if you have a problem in the thorax, if we're producing fluid, like in pleural pneumonia for example, we will actually have fluid instead of air, which means that we will get an ultrasound signal, whereas in a normal course we wouldn't. We can look for areas of consolidated lung, we can look for hernias, for example. If I put my probe here and I see lots of small intestine, I might think, hang on, maybe I have an abdominal hernia, a diaphragmatic hernia. Or you can look, again, not only in emergency cases, but more thorough investigations of medical cases with um, prolonged pleural effusion, prolonged history of coughing, or, or, or again, lung abscesses in cases like colococcus, for example, any masses, and you can use it for the heart as well if you have the right probes. And, and you to play a so, we have a problem when we try to image the lungs because we essentially presented with lots of just thin, white, bright lines. And if I tell you that a thin, white, bright line could either be bone or could be lung, then how are we going to distinguish whether we're scanning the rib surface, which is a thin, white, bright line, or whether we're scanning the lung surface, which is also a thin, white, bright line? Any ideas? So, one easy clue is to look for this shadow here. So the bone actually projects a shadow, so it will look sort of blacker rather than this artifact that the air produces. So this means it's a rib. If you're still not sure, again, use the advantage of the ultrasound being a dynamic modality so you can rest your probe, and in a normal animal, with the breathing movement, this bit will move, it will sort of glide, because the lung is gliding within the thorax. So just wait a little bit, and if it moves, if the bright white line moves, it's the bright white line of the lung, as opposed to being that of the ribs. And the, the um, systematic way to do it, if you're investigating the lung, is to again just run down each intercostal space, looking at that little bit of lung pleura that we can see in between, from the top of the animal to the bottom of the animal, from the first 
intercostal space to the last intercostal space, and then essentially you've covered the whole of the lung field that you can possibly cover. Now, which one's normal, which one's abnormal? <coughs> Hands up whoever thinks this is normal. Hands up whoever thinks this is normal. Good, so you're all right. This is normal, this is abnormal. Why? Because in a healthy lung, that should be full of air. So essentially we just get all our um, echoes back, all we see is a bright line. There's a little bit of irregularity here, there's actually a little bit of um, reaction, but overall it's rather normal. Whereas this, you can see, instead of being a continuous white line, there's an area here that we actually have some signal. And if we have some signal, it means that it isn't full of air because our ultrasound could penetrate. So it could be an abscess, it could be you know, some consolidation, it could be full of pus, it could be a lot of Kirkus abscess, for example. And another abnormality. So, this thing here, if I tell you this is in the thorax, what could this be? So I'm scanning roughly around here, let's say. No, I'm not, I'm actually scanning here, let's say. So this is the diaphragm. So it's actually a very nice image. This is the diaphragm, and I'm at the junction between the thorax and the abdomen. So this is my diaphragm, and you can see the liver just underneath the diaphragm, which means this should all be my lung. And it is, but you can see this is all bright and white because it's full of air, but the actual tip of the lung is not full of air. I get a signal that actually looks like the liver, so that means it's consolidated, be it because of pneumonia, be it because of, um, you know, whatever it might be. You get a diseased lung tip, and actually, look at it, it's floating in lots of fluid in the thorax. So this is an unhappy thorax. Other information that you can get from here, use the scale of this. So you can look, this is in centimeters, so you can see that the fluid, actually, this fluid pocket goes all the way to here, which is about, what, 11, 12 centimeters, if this is 10? So that's quite a lot of fluid. And it's <coughs> taken all of this just from all the in the lungs. And then finally, um, we have obviously the musculoskeletal ultrasound. And Ben has spoken more about that than he will, so I won't go into it uh, in depth. But this is very good, not only for the soft uh, tissue structures of the limb, but also for the bone surface. What it can't do is replace x ray in, in identifying um, full thickness damage to the actual bony structures. So, for example, I've actually already named these four structures, so who can name them for me now? Right, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Perfect, that sounds awesome. And this is the transverse plane, whereas this is the longitudinal plane. And look at it, I can actually see, so this is actually the origin of my suspensory ligament, so on the top part of the cannon bone, and look how well you can see the bone surface, so that, that back aspect of the metacarpals or the metatarsis. And if I had done some damage here that pulled off a little bit of bone, for example, I could see that because I can assess the surface of the bone. So again, it's not just necessarily for soft tissue, but you can use it for other things. You can look at for, you can use it for joints, um, you can use it um, to investigate lesions, um, and you can use it for bone as well. And this is just a rather complicated chart uh, which names the levels and the positioning of uh, the segments at each point of the leg. The only reason why this is done is for systematic and consistent approach and description. So if you go and look at the horse today and say, oh wow, look, I found a very big, about three centimeter lesion on the left forelimb at about the level 3-2A. 
and then your colleague that needs to go and recheck it next week actually knows where it is. It's not to just be overcomplicated, it's just to, to have a systematic way that we grade um, and that we localize each lesion so, so that we know exactly where it is, rather than saying, oh, a little bit up the leg, but you know, not quite midway, and it's just a little bit more accurate description. And you can look for all sorts of things. You can look for actual core lesions. So this is a huge black hole in it, which just means there's an enormous fiber disruption and it's now um, a vein, basically a void, um, which, could, um, which, could, which is your core lesion, actually. More subtle things. So most of the tendon damage doesn't actually present necessarily as a core lesion like this. But you can, again, take full advantage of all the machine facilities and you can measure, you can measure the size of the tendons, and you know if the structure is inflamed, if it's not something as obvious as this that you can immediately locate, you can say that it's just bigger because of the inflammation process, because the fibers and everything and all the cells are swollen. So you can measure it, you can divide the screen in half, you can compare both legs, compare both sizes, and then determine whether that measurement is normal or abnormal for that animal, uh, depending on what the other side is doing as well. And then again, you can look at the bone surface, and if you see there's a disruption of this, you can clearly see there's a little fragment that dislodged here, you can pretty much determine that there's um, a fragment on that bone surface, on that cortex bit, an avulsion or a trauma or whatever it is. And again, for example, looking at other uses, because you can essentially use it wherever you'd like. We've spoken about x-raying the withers, which is great if we're worried about bony pathology, if we're worried about um, fractures, if we worry about osteomyelitis, we've already spoken how we can identify little bits of gas glass and all of that. Well, you can complement that information with a scanner as well. So the scanner would give you a picture more like this. So this is actually an abscess tract all along here. You can try to follow it to evaluate how deep, how long it is, how thick it is. You can see whether it's well encapsulated and actually here, you can see that there is quite a nice little capsule as opposed to just being um, or free around there. And also, again, talking about the measurements, look at this, you can see that sort of the closest point is about five or six centimeters. So if you need to lance it, you know that you can't just do a little uh, two centimeter stab incision. You can take a lot of useful information from this. And then finally, like I said, just be creative. You can use it everywhere and anywhere. And according to context, you can determine what it is. So this big black hole without me looking at the patient and, and knowing what I'm scanning, I won't be able to say what it is. If I tell you that this is a rectal probe on top of the ovaries, then I might think, okay, this is a very big follicle. If, however, I tell you this is a mass within the abdomen, you can think, oh, it's a little small intestine that's very dilated. <coughs> or I can tell you this is just something right under the skin, in which case you can think, well, maybe it's an abscess full of pus. And it can be all of those things. And that's why clinical criteria and clinical um, judging is very important. You can use it for kidneys. You can use it for eyeballs, for example. Why not? You have no air in between. You have no bone in between. So you can investigate sort of retinal detachment if you have some. Or you can uh, investigate hyperpion if you have some pus in the eye or something along those lines. So that's it really. In conclusion, just be creative, understand the principle of both ultrasound and x-ray and then use them to your advantage, just explore them a little bit and understand that it's not only to detect but very important to characterize pathology, to be able to assess it, measure it and tailor your therapy accordingly. So that's it. Thank you very much for listening.